गणपति हवामहे कवि कवीनामुपमश्रवस्तम ज्येष्ठराजम ब्रह्मण ब्रह्मण स्पत आन शृण्वन्नूतिदसाधन ओ श्री महागणाधिपत नम ओ वृषभम चर्षणीना विश्वदाभ्यं बृहस्पति वरेण्यम ओं तद्विष्णो परम फल सदा पश्य सोरय दिवे वचक्षोरा तम ओ श्री महालक्ष्म्य नम ओ श्ली ह्री ज्योतिर्ब्राह्माय नम एंड एवरीबडी से हरे राम कृष्ण थ्री टाइम्स ओ हरे राम कृष्ण हरे राम कृष्ण हरे राम कृष्ण विल एक्चुअली एड वन मोर मंत्र विल डू थ्री टाइम्स आई से वन आई रिपीट थ्री टाइम्स यू ऑल्सो से विथ मी ओ ऐं गम वागणपत नम 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 Okay, we will continue the dasha unless you have any chart that you you want to see before we proceed. Yeah. July 10th, July 19th. Whoever is born having Saturn, Venus, K2 in a Leo. Right. So that means we can see before Saturn, Venus, K2 combination is uh, kind of stubborn uh, yoga. Right. So do you think uh, most of the three? Yeah, a lot of people with tapas yoga would have been born during that time. During that time, especially not everybody. Just just Saturn, Venus, Ketu being together is not tapas yoga. Being together in a in lagna or in a trine, th- that that will be auspicious. Even if they are in the eighth house or twelfth house, I will consider it very auspicious. So there will be some people who, who would be born. But the thing is, if you look at the Navamsa, Vimshamsa, Dasamsa, etc., you can know. whether that doesn't necessarily mean spiritual it only means somebody who who is passionate about some some kind of discipline pursuit of something so it could be a researcher it could be a spiritualist it could be anybody so you should look at the vimshamsa you should look at the other divisional charts to be sure but it is an auspicious time and especially actually you said july na june june 19 no, july 19 There is actually I just want to mention one thing. October 13 is a very very interesting day because on that day they will be so together within like one degree for me. 24 degrees or 12 degree, 11 degree area I thought. Around the 11th degree I thought, but wherever one second actually we can check. Basically it's another month from now. October 13. Oops. October 13 basically yeah they are in the 11th degree if you take October 13 afternoon for example K2 is at 10 degree 33 minutes Venus is at 10 degree 39 minutes Saturn is at 10 degree 53 minutes so basically within a within a within a arc of 20 arc arc minutes which is one third of a degree you have all the three planets usually three planet conjunctions are interesting rare three planets within such a small orb is extremely rare and that too it happens for the three planets who give tapas yoga so it is very interesting of course it is also it could result in some bad events uh, mundane events this is not re- this is not really a great combination this is a great combination in individual charts only for tapas tapasya tapasya not really for material success etc because venus is a planet of harmony is the planet of jalatatva and ketu is the planet of saturn is the planet of depletion and ketu is the planet of explosion so they basically rob so the vayu and jala is com- combination is not well saturn is vayu ketu is kind of fire uh, yeah and also and venus is jala venus is jala 
Right. Moreover, Venus is the Venus is basically he shows plentifulness, whereas Saturn and Ketu are depleting it. They are burn. They are they are, they are basically destroying. They are destructive. And whoever they are with, they destroy that 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 that, that tatwa. Whatever is shown by the other planet, if they are with Jupiter or Sun, whoever it is, you can basically say this this is the area. And Venus, what does he show? Venus is the planet of passion. peace, passion, harmony. On one on one end it is passion, but if you basically tone it down, it's basically harmony. So p- harmony, peace, all these things are shown by Venus. So this is not a great combination for the world. There can be some bad events for the world, but that is that is basically besides the point. The point I wanted to make is, for those who are interested in spiritual sadhana, that is a great time. And moreover, that happens during the Navratra, which are a which are a great time to do sadhana, especially if you are interested in the Divine Mother. That's a great time to do sadhana. So that particular day is very very is a very interesting day, and luckily it happens to be a weekend. Not a weekday when you have to take vacation from your work. So you could basically do something special on that day, do a lot of sadhana, spend the whole day meditating or whatever. It will be very beneficial. Basically, sadhana done on particular days is basically more potent than some other days. It can it can result in something faster than other days. So that's a very good day to take advantage of. Okay, so I would say the whole day. Yeah. Or plus minus one day, but basically that day is the peak. Okay. okay. Yeah. Okay. So the thing is, this is, yeah. This is happening in the tenth house. The fourth lord, the seventh lord, the lagna lord, being in the tenth house. So it's not really any raj yoga. If it is Scorpio Lagna, there isn't any special Rajoga between those planets, and they are in the tenth house. So, his father had a grandfather Well, let us see the chart later to to be more specific. But the thing is, it doesn't really Saturn, Venus, and Ketu being in any house is not really tapas yoga. It has to be in twelfth house, right? Swami, it can be a moksha trikona or it can be a trine. Oh, okay. Then there is it is of immense interest. If Saturn, Venus, and Ketu are closely conjoined in the twelfth from moon, it is of great interest. So that could show spirituality. That shows spirituality. Mm-hmm. That that does show somebody very spiritual. But what I was going to say is, had I not known about moon, just based on lagna, these planets being in the tenth house, the Saturn and Ketu, it does show some spiritual karmas. Basically, whether he does sadhana or not. Being doing big spiritual activities like doing big homas or doing big pujas, organizing big things in the society, that is a strong possibility. But the fact that they are in the twelfth from moon is also very interesting. So my my gut feeling is he'll be spiritual and he'll be doing some some big karmas leading to spirituality. Whether he will benefit materially or not is a different matter. So we'll we'll see that chart later. That does sound interesting. And Jupiter in Lagna is a great blessing. Against going mad or going crazy, like you said, which which you said runs in his family. Jupiter in Lagna is a great blessing. He always has Sri Ram Raksha. It's like mm-hmm. protective force. For me, he is a benefit. Yeah, fifth lord. He is the fifth lord of Purupunja. Moreover, he is a natural benefit. Of course, of course, functional benefit here. And he is Jupiter, the Karaka of intelligence. So when he sits in Lagna, which shows intelligence, he should protect him against. Going to any extremes. Yeah. What is the subtle difference between religiousness and spirituality? Yeah. See, that is actually not really an astrological question. That is a general question. So the question is, what is the difference between religiousness and spirituality? The reason I am asking is because if you look at some charts, yeah. uh, 
say sometimes hidden GS or the nth lord the fifth yeah. and say possibly hidden GS or ninth and eighth or combination you say. Yeah, you are saying from la, yeah. Correct. So, but right. the, See, the thing is, this, what is religion? What is spirituality? Right. Okay. Now, what is spirituality? What is the spirit? Spirit is basically the soul that is within you. The Brahman that pervades all is the spirit. And spirituality is understanding that. Understanding the Brahman that pervades all is basically spirituality. And it's not just a one stage thing basically. It's not a one step thing where you say, okay, now I am spiritual. Basically, the spiritual evolution of a person, it happens in many stages. First you may, first somebody thinks, oh, I am this body, I have to take good care of this body, I have to be beautiful, people have to think I am beautiful, I am smart, I am this, I am that. So there is strong identification with something that is fake, something that is very, very transient. Then the identification improves. As the person's, see, the perfectly spiritual being, a perfectly spiritual being fully identifies with Brahman. He is always identifying with Brahman and nothing else. He doesn't even say, I am so and so person. I have I had so and so life in the past life, so I was so and so being in the past life, I am so and so being in this life, these are my runas, I have fulfilled all the runas, I am done. He wouldn't even talk in those terms. For him there is no I, there is no I or there is no you, there is no he, there is no she. So he is basically, he, he, he or she only sees Brahman in all. So that is basically the highest state. Now, reaching that higher state from where we normally are, is not a one step process, it's a multi step process. So in the beginning you may slowly identify, identify less with the body, you may realize that there is there is something else inside, a soul. And then maybe after you progress further, you may even recall your previous life, I was so and so person in the life, I have a runa with this person, let me fulfill that runa. So all the karmas that are pushing you down, you may you may actually do something to ban those karmas, you may progress further, further. But the thing is eventually until you identify with Brahman until you until you don't have any identification with any entity in this universe except Brahman which is all not not one until then your spiritual evolution is still continuing so I will say the definition of spirituality is to to find the true self which is Brahman now what is religion religion is a tool in basically making this journey Spirituality is not really a journey, it is basically, I will say... It's a destination. It's a, I will say it's a destination. But normally we use the word, I am spiritual in the sense, I am basically pursuing that goal. Right, right. So that is why we normally don't use the word spiritual in that connotation. The connotation you use in is... For me? For me? Yeah, yeah. They have all the weaknesses of the Maya, basically. Yeah. So the thing is, okay. So let let us define spiritual as somebody who is interested in Brahman, somebody who at least realizes, doesn't realize Brahman fully, but realizes that there is something to be realized. For me? Yeah. Somebody like who seeks truth, the true self. Somebody who seeks the true self, which is basically the spirit. That is the meaning of spirit. Spirit means Atma, spiritual means Atma, Atma Gnani. And if, even if you are not Atma Gnani, you are, you are searching for Atma Gnana, the knowledge of self. Then I will say you are a spiritual person. That is the definition of spiritual person as far as I am concerned. You could define any way you want, but that is the standard definition. Now what is religious? There are so many religions that helps you, that help you find God. You have, you basically impose so many rules on yourself. You put so many yamas, niyamas, every day I will wake up at so and so time, every day morning I will do chandi homa or every day morning I will do 10 malas of gayatri or, or every morning I will decide one uh, chapter from Quran. Whatever your principle or every Sunday I will go to Bible, church and spend two hours listening to Bible or listening to a discourse on Bible. You basically put some rules that have been laid out by some spiritual, hopefully some spiritually advanced people so that a continued practice of those things, continuous practice of those uh, rituals or those procedures eventually helps you reach the goal, become more spiritual. So with that intent, 
somebody basically set up some rules. So religion is rule based. You have certain set of rules which somebody thought at some point of time will help you become more spiritual. That is why those rules were invented by somebody. But it doesn't necessarily work that way. The rules basically become so uh, so dry, so superficial that people don't realize the meaning of the rule, realize the intent of intent and purport behind the rule when the rule was originally invented by somebody or coined or formed by somebody, they just blindly follow the rule without understanding anything, then that person may not really be spiritual. He is religious. He is basically following certain rules. He thinks this is my duty. He is doing his duty very sincerely. But he is not getting any closer to God. He is not getting any closer to his true nature, his true self. So that, that would be an example. But the thing is, most people, not, though not hundred percent, a majority of the people who follow some religion blindly over a period of time, eventually they will get to some level of spirituality. On the other hand, there are people who are spiritual who don't, who don't really follow any religion, who don't really believe in any specific religion, but they, they have, they instinctively understand that there is a God who is controlling everything. And then they, they become close to him through their thoughts and actions rather than the principles that they obey. But that is more difficult. It is better to follow some religion or the other. Then what does irreligiousness mean? Because irreligious means from this uh, definition not following the set of rules. Right. That's not bad either. No. Me, not being religious is not bad. It's not, it's definitely not a bad thing. Then astrologically what does eighth Lord uh, See, the thing is, ninth house is important for religion. But when you talk about spirituality, ninth house is not really, it is only the start. Ninth house, if ninth house is very strong, it doesn't show a very religious, spiritually elevated being. But when you are talking about a spiritually elevated being, lagna, eighth house, twelfth house are far more important. Twelfth house is the final house of spirituality. It's the moksha sthana. Spirituality, the goal of spirituality is moksha, not dharma. Moksha. To basically let yourself go, to give up the concept of normal, all normal concepts of self. Because the final concept of self that I mentioned is, is basically something so subtle that if you actually reach that concept, it means you have given up all concepts of self. It can be reached only, it is like you have onion, you, you keep on peeling off various layers. Only when all the layers have been peeled off, you find that the core, which is the true Brahman. So, if you basically get to the concept of self as Brahman, it doesn't mean you are clinging on to some concept. It means you have actually let all concepts go. All conditioning of the mind as, I am this body, I am this soul, I am this, I am that. All those concepts are completely eliminated. Then only you have basically realized self. So, the thing is, twelfth, that is why twelfth house shows moksha, not even eighth house. Eighth house show only shows sadhana. But twelfth house is the house of moksha. No other house. Ninth house being strong doesn't mean you will get moksha. Only twelfth house, if it has Ketu, if it has uh, other auspicious influences, then only you are basically, uh, you are qualified to make some progress towards moksha or even get moksha. Vimshamsa is actually the eighth house, eighth house based chart. So it is basically the effort that you are putting. Eighth house is a moksha trikona, not a dharma trikona. So it is actually the chart of spirituality, the spiritual evolution. But for most people, the spiritual evolution starts with following some religion, following some religious rituals, or following, adhering to some religious principles. For most people, not all. Somebody may just wake up one day, he is wondering, who am I, who am I? Sunday, one day, things are revealed to him. Just because when she really wants to give you knowledge, based on whatever you have done, not in this life, but whatever you have done over many lives, if she really wants to grant you the knowledge of self, it's a split second for her. There is no, there is no apparent reason. It can just happen. So somebody can just realize, realize that the transient nature of everything that is manifested. He may have done some sadhana. He may have followed some religion also in a previous life. So, Ramana Maharshi is one. For me? Ramana Maharshi, yeah. He just woke up one day. He just said, what happens when I actually die? He just pretended that he was dying. He just became like a, 
like a kashta like a wood he became and then he experienced certain thing he experienced something else and then that triggered off something and then he was just immersed in thinking for so many years after that he just ran away from home he just sat in a remote place he just kept thinking thinking he just consumed very little food somebody was serving him food and then if in a few years he was known as maharshi so he didn't really follow any religion and if you see his chart it will be interesting see the thing is when i say somebody may be religious or irreligious don't take that as a good or bad thing nine if the ninth lord is in eighth house or something if the person is not quite religious it's not it's not a bad thing no, from no, the point no, of spirituality it's a bad thing and say yeah. it actually is good yes it may be good absolutely it, it may it may well just because somebody is not religious doesn't mean it is good it may be good or bad you you look at the moksha trikona dhamma trikona is being hammered shows certain thing but whether whether that means the person is person is actually getting moksha or not look at the moksha trikona further look at the 8th and 12th further really non religious may cause more problems for me yeah yeah <laughs> see i think is uh ramakrishna paramahansa used to say there is learned maya there is unlearned ignorant maya vidya maya vidya maya he used to say maya means illusion whatever we see and feel and sense whatever our senses basically show us in this universe is all illusion so as knowledge of astrology thinking that planets are influencing us and thinking that this knowledge helps you help people thinking that no a remedy basically helps you thinking that not uh, preventing a particular event and getting another so called good event is actually a benefit all this is maya only all this is an illusion at the same time thinking i should dominate that person that person is dominating me i should go and kill him that is also illusion so at one level there is no difference between all these between wanting to kill somebody because you don't like them or wanting to teach somebody astrology because it's a good subject not really much difference at one level but both are maya but one is learned maya one is unlearned maya one is tamasic one is sattvic but all all gunas are only clothes that you have to shed at one time if you want to be if you want to purify yourself and remove all the conditioning each guna has to be shed, shed off including sattva so from that point of view all is maya but he used to say if you have to leave one maya if you want if you want to go above one maya at a time go above avidya maya first if you are if you are basically surrounded in vidya maya it is easier to let it go at one point of time whereas if you are surrounded by avidya maya completely it is tough to let it go it basically clings on to you more strongly so from that point of view it's actually not a bad idea to be religious <coughs> and and another thing is really spiritually fully realized people there is no rule that they will be religious also just to be clear if you take rishis like vasishtha vishwamitra all these people they were quite religious even though they they realized that this is all just these are all superficial things they don't really matter suppose you are doing a puja what if you are wearing dirty clothes or what if you are wearing a clean clothes but if you for example if you if you go to a uh, a good vedic ceremony or something for example in the next week maharudram If I want to come in dirty clothes and be a replica and read Rudram, of course they won't let me do that. They will say you have to come in clean clothes. It's just symbolic. The real important thing is whether Shiva is happy with my recital of Rudram or not. That depends on the purity of my soul, the purity of my consciousness. If that purity is not there, whatever, however pure clothes I am wearing has no relevance at all. Similarly, if I am wearing the cleanest, new, brilliant clothes, but if my consciousness is is having all kinds of dirty thoughts again i'm not going to make shiva please shiva himself he is in a smashana he is basically he is naked he has all uh, the ashes basically smeared on his body he doesn't really care about all these things but when you are praying to him using a vedic ceremony the rule that they put is you have to wear clean clothes there are certain rules you have to take bath before you have to do sandhya vandanam you have to do this that so because people cannot ensure the internal purity of whoever is coming the replics who are performing various rituals they just ensure the external purity because at least that you can see with your physical eyes the other one only you can see with your divya chakshu not with the physical chakshus so people 
So this is all superficial. But the thing is, those who who are fully learned, what they do is they are like like I said earlier, they are like a fan that has been rotating. The electricity has been cut off, but the fan continues to rotate until they leave the body. So if a, if a rishi comes into a body for some purpose, he takes a body, comes comes back into this world in the kali yuga. Until he leaves the body, first he will be in maya. Then he will come out of the maya. He will realize self. And after he realizes self, he will be like a fan that is still rotating based on the purva vasanas. So what will he do? Well, it depends on what the purva vasanas that he took when coming into this body are. One self-realized person may be fighting a war like Arjuna after listening to Gita from Sri Krishna. Another self-realized person may be running a country like Vasistha. and giving all kinds of punishments to people including death capital punishment etc like vasistha another self realized person may be besides a gutter outside a temple and then uh, eating sharing food with a dog there may be food from the garbage can he may be sharing with the, sharing it with the god and not caring about anything else there may be another self realized person who is performing yagnas homas big yagnas going around and telling people do raj raj yoga yagna do this yagna do that yagna he may be studying that another self aware person may be studying astrological knowledge it it, it it all depends on who the person is what karmas the person had before he became realized so there's no thumb rule basically so being religious or being religious is neither a necessary nor a sufficient condition or the reverse of it as far as being spiritual or being self realized is concerned Now, what is drugdasha? What does it show? It is actually the progression of the ninth house, and you can say ninth house is religion, but the highest meaning of ninth house is God's light. And moreover, drug means uh, vision. So, so we are basically talking about the ray of light passing. And also, if you look at para Jaimini's verse on that, we have seen Parasara's verses earlier. Jaimini also mentioned drugdasha. What he said, I believe, is Kujadi Trikota Padakramena Drugdasha. That is Jemini Sephorism, Jemini Sutram. I think it's in the second adhya, second chapter, second yeah, two point four, second second adhya, second uh, part, the fourth adhya, the verse number I forgot, something in twenty, I believe, twenty one or so. So the the verse is Kujadi Trikota Padakramena Drugdasha. Starting from the ninth, kuja means ninth in the Karpayadi coding. Starting from the ninth, uh, trikuta in groups of three. Starting from the ninth in groups of three, padakramena. Padakramena was in, uh, interpreted by Sanjayji as the padakrama, basically based on the Oja Pada Samupada. But pada, another meaning of pada is apart from foot, another meaning is the ray of light that helps you see things. So, padakramena. It also means the third eye, the the place between the eyebrows. That is also another meaning of pada. So, padakramena means in the order of the passing of the ray of light is drukdasha. So, we are talking about a dasha of vision. Druk means vision. So, no wonder pada means the passing of the ray of light. So, the so the storehouse of light in your chart is ninth house. It is God's light that is falling that will flow that will help you in all your activities. Dharma, Artha, Kama, Moksha, everything. That is the that is the guidance. That is God's light. And the light basically, just as how 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 why am why am I able to see Sheshu right now? Some light is falling on him. It's reflecting and coming to my eyes. So seeing is nothing but reflection of light from one thing to another, another thing to another, and so on. So Durgesha is basically tracing how the light travels with time, how the light of God, and reflects on various things and makes them visible. That is basically the philosophical meaning of it. So, even though it is starting from the ninth house, it is not just a dasha of dharma. It is basically the dasha of how God's light is helping you see. What what is the real purpose of God's light? To see yourself. So so from that point of view, even the real purpose of religion is to see your true self. That is the real purpose. So so anyway. Uh, So, so, so to summarize, Drugdasha shows religious activities as well as spiritual the spiritual progress that results from those religious activities. 
ओके एनी अदर क्वेश्चन या श्योर फर्स्ट लेट मी जस्ट गो डू ए कपल ऑफ एग्जाम्पल्स दैट आई दैट आई वॉन्टेड टू डू इन अ क्लास आई विल आई विल इवेंचुअली सी ऑल योर थर्ट आई डेफिनेटली सी यू बट टू सी द थिंग इज वेन वी सी योर थर्ट देर मे नॉट समथिंग मे नॉट रियली स्टैंड आउट द थर्ट मे बी मे बी आर्डिनरी आई नॉट स्टेइंग यू आर आर्डिनरी पीपल यू मे बी फॉर ऑल यू नो ऑल ऑफ यू मे बी रियली ग्रेट पीपल फॉर ग्रेट स्टेजेस फॉर एग्जाम्पल सो आई डोंट रियली बट वी विल सी बट they may or may not be able to illustrate the concept so if we take the thoughts of people who did have important events epoch making spiritual events in their lives it will basically the concepts will become clear so I'll, i want to continue some more examples for me you have the directory which you had ah excellent excellent no he says we have so i have, i trust him i trust him more than you <laughs> you don't even know where they are they should be where you okay, put okay, them okay 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 <laughs> I'm just kidding, sir. I, I only I like pulling your leg. Program fault. Okay. I think he, my confidence may be misplaced. Oh, you say? <laughs> no pressure. In my case, there's nothing I can't do. Where you put them? <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't. I wouldn't recover. It's your computer. I didn't move anything to the wheel. <laughs> I put the same directory which creates the Jodh issue. Okay. Oh, so you want to see where the uh, executable is then? Yeah. No, Why don't we? Okay, go ahead. What What I suggest for you? I think the one sec, one sec. Let's see. Property. You said, yeah, properties of the icon. So it's in program file. Jodisha Durgesha. Jodisha Durgesha. Where is the here? Okay, okay. See, Pro- program file. Jodisha. Drugdasha, ah, bin. So you are saying it is in Drugdasha charts. Excellent. Okay, okay. So what are the charts that we saw? I think in the class we saw in the in the seminar we saw Chandrika Saraswati Swami girl. We saw Jain Saraswati also we saw, right? Swami Shivananda. I think we haven't seen that. Yeah, I'll see Shivananda. Have we have we seen Arvindo Ko? Arvindo Ko? We did. Okay, excellent. Yes, I think we did. Let's see Swami Shivananda. don't say so we'll see the chart of swami shivananda of rishikesh he is the one who uh, established divine life society right is that the right thing think so yeah dls and if you go to dlshq.org hq i think stands for headquarters you can see his bio, detailed biography he is on the current swami ji so the birth date is 1887 september 8 4:16 am The time zone is five hours eleven minutes east of GMT. That must be that must be the local mean time. Five hours eleven minutes east of GMT. The longitude is seventy seven degrees forty minutes. The latitude is eight degrees forty eight minutes north. Seventy seven degrees forty minutes east. Eight degrees forty eight minutes north. Unfortunately, I don't know the name of the place, but it does sound like it's in south, way south. Yeah. 77 degrees means something like Kerala, uh, Karnataka border, Tamil Nadu that border. Let's talk about his name. Yeah, if you go to dlshq.org, I think you can find out where he was born. Unfortunately, I didn't do that. So, uh, the he he has lagna in the in the Asrasha fourth bada, 28 degrees 14 minutes Cancer. You use Lahiri, yes. Okay, and. Moon is at twenty-two degrees forty-one minutes Aries. Okay, so let us see Drukdasha. We start from Pisces, of course, and from eighty-seven to ninety-six is Pisces Dasha. From ninety-six to nineteen o five is Sagittarius Dasha. From nineteen o five to nineteen fourteen is Virgo Dasha. From nineteen fourteen to nineteen thirty-three is Gemini Dasha, and then we are moving to tenth house. Aries Dasha is from nineteen twenty-three to September. Till 1930 September, this was the dasha that turned things around. Until 1923, he was a successful doctor in Malaysia or Singapore, one of those. Malaysia, Malaysia right? In Malaysia, he had a practice there. He was a medical doctor. He was very successful, and he was, he was uh, his uh, the website says that he used to like luxurious goods. 
used to wear nice gems, nice rings, nice chains, and then he used to have, his how home used to have nice luxurious goods. So he was interested in luxuries of the life, and then. Somebody gave him some book written by some sadhu about spirituality, and then that got him interested in spirituality. And I believe in 1923 or 1924, I believe. I think 1924. Unfortunately, I, I had the cheat sheet where I noted the events when I came for the seminar, but I don't have it in my wallet right now. I misplaced it somewhere. So if we go to the website, we can you can verify the date. But around that time frame, I think 1924. That is when he came to, came to India. He visited India. And then he decided, let me renounce this world. Let me become a sannyasi. He just, just like that, he decided. And then he went to North India. He went on a tour to North India. And when he was in Rishikesh or maybe Varanasi, somewhere in North India, one Swamiji came to him and said, "Okay, the time has come. Come, I'll give you diksha." He said, "Okay, fine. I'll, I'll take diksha." It was so simple. He got, he took diksha from him, and then he spent. He spent several years in intense tapasya, intense tapasya. He was doing immense sadhana, and he also spent lot of time doing seva to various patients. There, being a medical doctor, he basically took care of their health problems and people with uh, people with kushtu and other diseases. He basically cleaned their bodies, cleaned their legs, shampooed their shampooed and massaged their legs. Like that, he took took care of people. And also, he spent a lot of time in a hut that was infested by snakes and scorpions. He basically sat down there, and then he did sadhana. I mean, if you really believe that Ali is Brahman, of course, scorpion is also Brahman. And if scorpion bites you, the poison that enters you is also Brahman. If you really are thinking in those terms, poison does nothing to you. Ah, uh, fire does nothing to you. Nothing does nothing to you. If you are really thinking that way, but if the division comes in your mind, the duality comes. Oh, this is poison. This this kills. The moment it comes, of course, it becomes poison. So he was. If you really want to test yourself, saying something in a class like this is one thing. Actually, doing it is another, quite another. So he actually did it. He he did intense tapasya, and then he actually his website claims that he actually experienced nirvikalpa samadhi. They don't give the date, but in this 1927 time frame, around 1927 or so, after two years. Of intense sadhana, they claim that he experienced nirvikalpa samadhi. Savikalpa samadhi is where you still have a seed of I. That may be, it may not be like Narasimha or Vijay. It may be like you identify with something else. Like maybe you identify with with your favorite devata, Mahalakshmi or Kali. So, so you are looking at the whole universe from their point of view. So that samadhi is also great. But in nirvikalpa, there is no seed at all. There is only Brahman. There, there is no division. There are not even gods. There are no demons. Nothing. No beings. So that is the highest, the highest that you can experience. So he apparently experienced that. And let us see if renunciation and great spiritual experiences make sense in the Dasya of Aries. What is special about Aries? First of all, for me, Lagna Lord is there, good, but it doesn't really mean great spiritual experiences. Look at first of all, a guru suddenly came to him. Is the ninth lord or Bhratgarka aspecting Aries? Bhratgarka is Mercury. Is Mercury aspecting Moon? Uh, aspecting Aries, of course. Mercury is in Leo. He is aspecting Aries. So a guru can come during this dasha. Now, what is the progress lagna in this dasha? Funny, Leo, because that is the fifth house. Aries is the progress ninth house, so progress lagna is Leo. Taking Leo as lagna, what are the influences? The twelfth house is extremely strong. Mars, Saturn, and Ketu. Three male fixed, including Ketu, the Moksha Karaka. For me, sorry, Rahu, Rahu, I'm sorry. So Rahu, Ketu, Ketu is in the other other house. So Mars, Saturn, and Rahu, the three male fixed planets are in the twelfth house. So twelfth house is extremely strong. If you recall, when we did this in the case of Jayendra Saraswati Swami Gadu and also Chandrakar Saraswati Swami Swami Gadu, they also had the they, they had three planets or two pla I think three planets in the twelfth from the progress lagna in the dasha when they took renunciation, but both of them had Mercury. 
there could be show some forms of devi some sattvic or rajasic forms of the divine mother but here this is the influence is male hip class very ugra sadhana so he does extremely intense sadhana unlike in the other case where in the case of chandrakara sadhana this swami girl the planets were mercury sun and jupiter in the other case i think mercury ketu and somebody else sun mercury sun and ketu mercury sun and jupiter these were the planets in the case of the other the kanchi swami the two swami so sun is there sun of uh, vedic knowledge and dharmic knowledge and mercury was there who shows tripura sundariya sattvic forms of the mother whereas here is all ugra ugra graha so the sadhana is extremely intense and saturn and rahu are there two vayu graha so some some sadhana involving pranayama rajayoga is also possible saturn shows rajayoga the path of vayu see you have four different paths spiritually one is uh, sri krishna teaches all these in gita bhagavad gita all are valid path uh, gnana yoga gnana yoga is basically the path of vedanta like ramana maharshi he was basically a gnana yogi you think who am i is this real what is real you keep on removing these layers of onion like i said earlier you realize the self so that is gnana yoga the, that is shown by the fire element gnana yoga is essentially fire so when the fire is strong you can expect gnana yoga the disadvantage of gnana yoga is it is risky from the point of view that if there are a lot of karma pulling you down if you are not really ready if you are not an not an already purified soul not fully pure but all, almost purified soul you will not make much progress with it because there are so many karmas that are pulling you down just by analyzing and thinking you will not reach the truth so this is for somebody who has already purified himself in fire very heavily so this part is for such people and the other part is karma yoga karma yoga is shown by can you guess which element mercury yeah mercury so earth element so you are actually you don't say this world is maya this body is maya you don't say that you just say well all the form that is there it is not it, maybe it is maya but it is also brahman or who you are you are favorite devata is if you like narayana you say all this is narayana or if you like shiva you say all this is shiva and you serve shiva by serving all these forms if there is an animal in trouble go and serve the animal if there is a person in trouble you go and serve the per- person so while you do this you basically get accustomed to seeing the highest the brahman in all with a form even with a form so you realize the true nature so while when you do it without any uh, selfishness you will lose your self completely your your self will completely melt one day and then you you really see krishna or shiva in all beings so this is the path of karma where you actually act and serve people so this is the path of this is the path of bhutatva and then bhakti yoga bhakti yoga is the path of jala bhakti is you, you melt in the in devotion to some god you you only want to see that god you say mahalakshmi when will you come and show in front, show yourself in front, in front of me or kali when will you come and show, show yourself in front, in front of me or sri krishna when will you come i want to see you nothing matters to you in, in life you just single mindedly devote yourself to that devata you want to see that devata and you you say that the whole universe is emanating from that devata that devata is equivalent to brahman and you basically devote yourself to that devata so this is jala tattva parni yeah venus venus is jala of course moon and venus show this path sun and mars yeah so these are the path and the fourth path of the fourth path is rajayoga in rajayoga you basically use your use the vayu use the breath you see you don't really need an idol in front of you to worship you don't need people you don't need a form you don't need anything you just the, the the when you breathe the air you just see brahman in the air you just say i'm just i'm just the air you just lose consciousness of your body eventually and that way also you can reach the highest that, so the, that part is shown by vayu the vayu tattva and of course akasha what is it it's not it doesn't specifically have a path associated with it because the yoga itself is akasha basically union with the communion with the divinity communion with the highest 
itself is shown by Akash Tattva. And then, in addition, when Bhu, Jala, Agni and Vayu are combining, it is through one of these four paths, Jnana Yoga, Bhakti Yoga, Karma Yoga and Raj Yoga. And the disadvantage of Raj Yoga, Ramakrishna Paramahamsa used to say, he taught Raj Yoga to some of his students, some of his, he had 12 uh, best disciples. To some of them he taught Raj Yoga, but he told them, don't teach it to anybody. Of course, Vivekananda did teach it to some people, and once actually he almost passed, he basically lost his consciousness while do, doing that. Even somebody of his stature, according to Ramakrishna, he was a Maharshi. Vivekananda was a Maharshi in, in one of the previous lives. And even he lost his consciousness while doing that. That shows the risk of it, because even Vivekananda says the same thing. The disadvantage of these practices in Kali Yuga is, the air you breathe itself is so impure. So, when you, when you see divinity in the air, and the air itself is impure, obviously there are, there are problems. So, first you should, you should purify whatever you are using. If you are, suppose you are using an idol, and you see God in that idol, and you just keep worshipping, worshipping, worshipping God in that particular idol. Then, the idol may have impurity. Somebody may have designed it at a bad time, at a bad muhurta. Or somebody while sculpting the idol, may have had bad thoughts in the mind. All those become impurities in that particular idol. So, when you call the God to come and, when you invoke the God to come and sit in that idol, and, and accept the, your offering, whether they are mantras or whether they are flowers or whatever they are, there is going to be some problem in making that happen. Similarly, when you call God into your breath, there is going to be some problem because the air you are breathing is so impure. For this reason, Vimalananda, Swami Vimalananda, the, the person uh, whose student Robert Svoboda wrote these books, Aghora, Kundalini, uh, those three parts of the Aghora series, that is why he says, he very strongly says, Homam is the best approach in Kali Yuga. And that is what I also, I also advocate in my website. That is why I am spreading Mahagantri Homam. The thing is, all other elements can be, can be corrupted in the Kali Yuga. But fire can never be corrupted. Fire itself is the purest and it purifies. Just as, let me give an analogy. Suppose I sit next to Seshu. I am spending all my time with Seshu. I will imbibe some characteristics of Seshu. Or if I am with a king, the king inside me becomes stronger. If I am with a Vilasa Purusha, somebody who is basically enjoying life, there is, a, there is somebody inside me who wants to enjoy life too. There are various beings within you. So, the Venus within me will become stronger eventually. Like that, when you are spending lot of time near a fire, worshipping fire, the fire inside you becomes stronger. And the nature of fire is to burn and of course, not just burn, but to purify. So, eventually you become, you become purer. Anyway, I am deviating. So, the thing is, uh, he basically, here the planets in question are Saturn and Rahu, two Vaitatva planets. So, the, the path of Raj Yoga was also used by him. He, he basically did some Raj Yoga and actually he wrote a really nice, nice book on Raj Yoga, not because he wanted to spread it. He clearly said, this is very dangerous in this Yoga unless you have a really, really qualified master guiding you. But I want to basically write this book so that misconceptions are clear. Otherwise, all kinds of all kinds of nonsense is basically passing off as knowledge. So I want to basically put down what is genuine. So he wrote a book on Raj Yoga and Kundalini. So that book may be, a, uh, if you are interested in this part, that is a that is a good resource. So coming back to astrology, so Mars, Saturn, and Rahu being in the twelfth house accentuates the twelfth house. So Sanyasa during this period and also intense sadhana is a possibility. In addition. Well, Rahu is a materialistic planet, that is true. But when he is in the twelfth house, he is not a materialistic planet. If he is in the third house or sixth house or eleventh house, he, he, he wants to give material success. But twelfth house is not the house of material success, twelfth house from Lagna. So it is not really, he does not really become, a, become an obstacle. And moreover, in the natal chart, one second, sorry. In the natal chart, Saturn and Rahu are the eighth, eighth lords of sadhana and they happen to be in the twelfth house of mokshasthana from the dasa lagna. Yes. Now being in twelfth house, we actually will take him way past uh, beyond the boundaries in spirituality. Right. Rahu, Rahu and Ketu are very vital to experiencing 
experiencing that which is beyond form experiencing that which is beyond anything that manifests so rahu and ketu in 12th is actually very auspicious yes the, the agendas of the planets is also important i would i would say more important but that is also important if a planet is in the 12th house from dasha sign and if he is if his agenda is something else he may not work towards the 12th house so strong for me yeah from dasha lagna he is the 7th lord but if you see the natal chart he is the 8th lord of sasana but the thing is in the dasha lagna in the from the dasha lagna if you see saturn and rahu they are the 7th lords in the 12th house what is the meaning of 7th lord being in the 12th house last of desires basically give, letting the desires go and also letting the seventh house is also the house of uh, spouse etc so basically renouncing relationship renouncing marriage renouncing sex etc all those can also be shown by the seventh lord being in the 12th house so will you take the uh, see when you analyze the chart just take the dasha lagna as lagna and analyze the chart but what i am saying is to see whether a particular combination that you see is really really a strong combination you can see what is the agenda of the planets from the natal chart if you for example see from the dasha lagna a big rajyoga in the 10th house so you may say this person not only uh, he experiences something spiritually but he does some big karma like maybe he establishes a big ashram or something or a big society like he did divine life society so you want to see that kind of things suppose there is there is a big conglomeration in the 10th house from dasha lagna and if one of them happens to be the 9th lord or 10th lord from the natal lagna also it in, it is basically strengthens the combination because he has the agenda to establish something and he is showing establishing something in this dasha so the result will be stronger right now let us see the the dasha pravesha chakra of this interesting dasha how is the dasha pravesha chakra Leo, if you take as lagna, what are the combinations on it? There are five planets in it. There is Sun, Moon, Rahu, Sun, Moon, Mars, Rahu, and Venus. Is, is this a yoga? Well, there will be several yogas in a case like this, but there is a specific yoga. This is a specific yoga called Pravrajya Yoga or Parivraj Yoga. If the tenth lord is in a quadrant along with four other planets, it shows a sanyasi. If the tenth lord is in a quadrant with four other planets, it shows a sanyasi. And actually, some people even say four or more planets in a quadrant makes a, makes one a sanyasi, makes one a renunciate. Some people say that also. So here, not four, but five planets are in lagna. Which show, first of all, apart from yoga, even if you don't know Parivraj Yoga, the fact that there are so many planets, five planets in lagna, including the twelfth lord, including lagna lord, including Uh, rahu including yokarka dhar dharma lord all these things basically show some big things happening in this dasha even if you do very superficial astrology you can say such a strong lagna strong or not such a such a such an active lagna lagna with so much happening shows some big epo making events in this particular dasha and now specifically this is pravraja yoga and you have 12th house planets in the natal chart also from the dasha lagna so you can say he becomes a sanyasi so actually i would say had this person come to you before you could have actually predicted that there is a very good chance of him becoming a sanyasi the, the, the case is very very strong now i said in the last class i may i may not have said i think i said that i have noticed of course you can't find lot of examples of this you will find very very few examples but i said that when people experience nirvikalpa samadhi i have seen that sun and sun and un slash or moon sun and moon or sun or moon he is afflicted by ketu on lagna axis in the in the dasha pravesha of the durga i have seen that in a couple of charts in a few charts huh? yeah rahu shukra hansa also we have seen in the in the seminar and there is one more chart which i can't basically i i, I the data i don't have permission to reveal so i have so like i said you can't find lot of examples so i had three examples in which i could basically see that combination so they experience the highest state of nirvikalpa samadhi in the dasha whose dasha pravesh chakra had 
सन मून राहु केतु कॉम्बिनेशन ऑन द लग्ना एक्सिस विषादर रामकृष्ण परमहंस ऑल्सो हैड दिस कॉम्बिनेशन द दशा व्हेन तोतापुरी केम टू हिम एंड टुक हिम टू निर्कल्पा एंड ही क्लेम दैट ही नॉट ही बट हिज वेबसाइट क्लेम दैट ही एक्सपीरियंस निर्कल्प समाधि एंड whether that is true or not the fact that sun and moon are being eclipsed in the lagna can show basically mind reaching these high states where mind becomes a no mind in vasishtha's world mind becoming a no mind mind being basically being eclipsed okay so let us let us i will do some more example charts in the in the next class but what i want to do now is uh, actually we have a lot of interesting charts we will see them in the we will take up another couple of charts in the next class i want to do one of you guys let me restart mean while i restart you decide who start first okay ladies first <laughs> we'll do she said ladies first so we'll see okay data do you have a chart you think so <coughs> if you can look at the files maybe i have latest one okay i will let you try in the sun our data there is only you are like that huh? yeah i restarted it yeah, only you are like that you forget you where your jupiter is your saturn is see i am even forgetting my ownership of my data <laughs> I'm going half the way, half the way. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now she has two hundred in lag now. This is the right data. Okay, the data is we are going to see the chart of Vijaya. The right, the data is nineteen sixty-five, November eleven, seven fifty-seven p.m. Indian Standard Time, five hours thirty minutes east of GMT. मारुटेरु एम ए आर यू टी यू आर एम ए आर यू टी ई आर यू मारुटेरु एटी वन डिग्री फार्टी फोर मिनिट्स ईस्ट सिक्सटीन डिग्री थर्टी एट मिनिट्स नॉर्थ इन आंध्र प्रदेश ओके इंडिया ओके नाउ द लग्ना शुड बी एट थ्री डिग्री ट्वेंटी वन मिनिट्स इन जेमिनाई एंड मून शुड बी एट ट्वेंटी सिक्स डिग्री फार्टी वन मिनिट्स टॉरस मून विथ राहु Okay. Now let us see the Drukdasha. What is the Drukdasha? What are the Drukdasha standing? Do you have any specific questions when while we see Drukdasha? We just want to know how your future is. Yeah. Just what is yeah. My future is showing. Okay. Good. So she wants her Drukdasha to be analyzed. She doesn't have any specific questions. She wants to see how her Drukdasha is. What is what is the guess of the class about the future? ओके हु इज द आत्मकार का आत्मकार का इज मून भ्रातकार का इज मेरकरी ओके राहु मून या राहु मून केतु मेरकरी आर ऑन द एक्सिस राइट ऑन द ट्वेल्थ हाउस एक्सिस ओके नाउ व्हाट इज द दशा रनिंग राइट नाउ द दशा रनिंग राइट नाउ सिंस 2003 नवंबर Till 2012 November. By the way, for those of you who are listening to this audio, I will very soon re- release a software that does this computation. But if you uh, go through the audio of the seminar, you can actually find this. Or if you go through the audio of the last class where I describe the calculation again, this is actually extremely simple to calculate manually. You can just calculate this in like 20 seconds manually. So this is very easy. And for Dasha Pravesh Chakra. You can just go to Tajika chart of the corresponding year, and then look at the Tajika chart from the Dasha Lagna. So it's very easy. You, even with existing Jehora, you can manage. But I will release a Jehora that does this Druk Dasha. And also, if you want a detailed description of the calculations, judgment, etc., and uh, and some examples, you can read Jyotish Digest, which is yet to come after the October 2007 issue, October to December issue. So that issue will have a have an article on Druk Dasha. For me? Okay. Why? 
That means you are using the old, old Durgasa, the SJC Durgasa, you are not using Parasara Durgasa. If you use the special Jehora that I gave you guys at the seminar, then, then you will get the same calculation. Now they match? Okay, I'll let you work on it. They should match. They should match because you have the same software. Any questions? He didn't have it. Because he wasn't at the conference, he didn't get the conference. He was at the conference, but not on that day. Oh, I see. Okay. Okay. You guys, you guys work it out. So, she is running Sagittarius Dasha from November 2003 till 2012 November. Now, first, let us analyze based on the natal chart. How is it? What are the influences on Sagittarius? For me? It is the seventh house, right? Eighth house from moon, that is what he means. Moon is strong. Sagittarius is strong. No, what are we analyzing? Are we analyzing just a natal chart or a Yeah, just a natal chart, Durgasa. So, how do you analyze? What are the influences on on Sagittarius. The influences are that of Venus and Mars, right? Okay. They are giving what? Are they giving any yogas? They are giving Bhimanta Yoga. Venus is the fifth lord and Mars is the sixth lord. So, they are together and aspecting Lagna. So, there is an association between Lagna, fifth and sixth through Venus and Mars. And of course, they are aspecting Lagna lord, uh, seventh lord, uh, I mean Jupiter in Lagna too. So, there is a Bhimanta Yoga. So, the Drugdasa is activating the Dhimanta Yoga, that's it, nothing, nothing much. But what is of interest is to see the fifth house from Lagna, fifth house from Dasha sign as the Lagna. So Sagittarius, if you take the fifth from there, it is Aries. So take Aries as Lagna and analyze the chart. How is the chart? The ninth house is eighth and ninth house is strong. Eighth house contains eighth Lord Ketu along with Mercury. So eighth house, eighth house is the house of sadhana, the hard work that you put in for spiritual progress. And Ketu is there, that is always beneficial. Ketu is the karaka of moksha. So the fact that Mercury and Ketu are there suggests that this is a this period will increase the spiritual sadhana of the person. Sahana means uh, it can be doing a ritual, doing a puja, doing a mantra or just meditating. It is basically spending some time or energy trying to reach God, thinking of God, thinking of that goal. It can be mental also. Like I said, the karma yoga, I, I said, it doesn't have to be bhakti yoga. There is karma yoga, there is jnana yoga. So you don't have to do any puja. You just keep thinking, if you read some Vedanta book like Yoga Vasishtham or some Ramana Maharshi's teachings, and if you think this is all Maya, and if you try to cultivate the sense of detachment basically, because at the end of it, I said, the spiritual, the height of the spiritual experience is to experience the true self, which will happen only when all the fake selves are basically shut off, all these layers which comes only with detachment, detachment from one thing, then detachment from another thing, then detachment from one more thing. So, if you are cultivating the detachment just through vichara, vichara meaning just thought, that is also, that is also eighth house, that is also sadhana. Or, you help lot of people, there are lot of people who need help. You, you think Manav Seva is Madhav Seva, serving man is serving God, or serving animals is serving God, all is God. You serve people, or you serve your husband, or your children without any selfishness and you cultivate some detachment while doing that and also some devotion to other beings and see God, that is also sahana. Or you, you do a particular puja, every day you spend let's say half hour doing a particular mantra, that is also sahana. Or you spend half hour doing some pranayama or some, some raja yoga technique, that is also sahana. So sahana is not restricted to one thing, it can be anything, but it is an effort directed at 
finding God. Okay. Right. That is actually not foolproof. You don't have any foolproof principles. But what you can say is Mercury. What is the out of the four yogas that I mentioned? Which is the yoga shown by Mercury? Mercury is Karma Yoga. And Ketu. Ketu is a planet of, is basically a fairy planet. He is actually not really, he doesn't have any form. But if you must give one of the tattvas, he is basically a fairy planet. And fire means Gnana. So some, some knowledge. And Mercury. Mercury shows? Uh, Artha. Uh, Mercury shows Bhu. So Karma. So basically more Karma Yoga, more service and more activities. And serving through actions. So that is what Mercury suggests. And how about, apart from the 8th house, the 9th is also very strong. The Lagna Lord and the 7th Lord Venus are in the 9th house. And 9th house is the house of? The Lagna from Aries. The Lagna Lord Mars and the 7th Lord Venus are together in the 9th house. This is the Rajoga between them. Lagna Lord and 7th Lord together is the Rajoga, right? So, uh, Lagna, so what does it show? Seventh house is the house of relationships. Of course, not necessarily relationship with anybody, but in the spiritual pursuit. And in the ninth house, ninth house means religion. So, Lagna Lord and Seventh Lord in the ninth house, giving a Rajoga means, actually apart from serving people etc. that I mentioned earlier, the sadhana of service shown by Mercury and Ketu, they will also be dealing with some people and some following dharma. Basically, strong ninth house shows following dharmic, doing dharmic activities. And seventh house shows friends are enemies, but other people. Seventh is other people. Yeah. Well, I'm not saying they are enemies, but other people. Basically, it shows, and Lagna Lord and seventh Lord being together means being out, outgoing and spending more time with other people, basically, coming together with others for dharmic activities. She is definitely more outgoing now than Fifth Lord? Yeah? Right. What does it show? You want to, what is fifth house? What does fifth house show? Fifth house is the house of devotion. Is debilitation weak or strong? Exaltation is basically, I said, a state akin to excitement. Whereas debilitation is a state akin to humility basically. So, when it comes to D20 or spiritual matters, the debilitated planet can actually show humility. So, when it comes to bhakti, following the bhakti marga, there can be some humility basically. So, some cultivation of humility. It's not a bad combination at all. Fifth Lord in a Kendra in debilitation is not a bad combination. Yeah. Sun is the Karaka, pardon me? Sun is the planet of uh, ego, basically. And he is aspecting Lagna by Grahadrishti. So that can actually show, Sun in the seventh house can show more outgoing, uh, more authoritative nature with other people. People who have a, uh, have Sun in the seventh house, they are basically authoritative with people, they command people. But that Sun is debilitated, so it can show actually some withdrawal in the natural, in, in, in the tendency and it can actually show humility. So, it's not really a bad combination. The only thing is, the fourth lord is showing some confusion. The fourth lord moon, though he is exalted, he is with Rahu, Padhaka lord Rahu. So, for, what is fourth house? Yes. Good point, good point. But let me first finish the first team of thought, then we will pick up yours. So, fourth Lord shows the direction, the spiritual direction in your pursuit. And Rahu being there means Rahu eclipses moon. So, the direction and sense of well-being, sense of happiness, sense of, okay, I have the right way now. That is disturbed a little bit by Rahu. But then, like he said, Rahu actually goes beyond. And Rahu and Ketu are good for spiritual progress. So, 
there is some disturbance in the spiritual direction of the person but at the end there is a big expansion of the spiritual direction of the person so there is what i would say based on the fourth lord moon in exaltation with rahu and ninth lord even though he is in manakarga sthana he is aspecting ninth and ninth lord aspecting ninth is good it shows so strong dharma ninth is extremely strong so it shows a very strong dharma during this time but how is the next dasha actually how is the dasha pravesha we haven't seen that at all oops what happened how is the dasha pravesha chakra wow okay interesting so This is the birth of the dasha, right? Birth of the dasha and vesting the entity. Right. So if that matches with the natal, then more. Correct. Whichever factors are matching between the two, the, those results we can be more confident of. And factors which are only showing up in one chart and not in the other, we are not so confident to make predictions on those. Just confirmation, basically. So there are certain aspects that are. See, there are certain aspects in the natal chart that are that are basically wanting to be fulfilled during this dasha. And out of those, when the dasha started, certain factors are more conducive. So, before we give a reading on anything, we should uh, look at both before we say. If you can look at both, that is excellent. It is definitely a good idea. If you can. So, in this dasha, the eighth house is again strong. If you look at the, if you look at Aries as lagna, Aries contains Rahu. And the the eighth house has Venus and Mercury. Seventh and eighth lords are exchanging Venus and Ketu. So the same yoga between Venus and Ketu that was there associated with the eighth house in the oh actually no 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 that was with Mercury. I'm, I'm confused. Okay. So basically the there is there is a there is a there is an interesting combination in the eighth house. And what about the ninth house now? Is this strong here also? Well, it's aspected by Saturn and Moon, which is not really doesn't really show a lot of dharmic activity. But the interesting thing is, the ninth lord Jupiter is in fifth house of Purvapunja, and he is he is basically in a trine from the ninth house. So whenever ninth lord is in a trine, is in the ninth or first or fifth, it is very auspicious for the ninth house. He is basically in the ninth house from ninth house, protecting the ninth house. So, dharmic activities will increase. Is what we said earlier. That basically, we can still say that. And we can definitely say Venus. Has, now, Venus and Mercury are in the eighth house. Venus shows bhakti, and Mercury shows, like we said, the karma yoga. So, karma and bhakti basically are exchanging. Right. Venus and Ketu are exchanging. Right. Right. So, actually, the Ketu and Mercury. So it is actually repeating whatever is in the natal chart. So there is there is some karma along with some understanding, some subtler understanding that comes with the internal gnana. So some undue, some detached karma will be quite possible during this dasha. So this is a, this is an interesting dasha. Pardon me. <laughs> Actually, I will uh, I will humbly request you. It was just an observation based on three charts that I made. It may or may not be, but the thing is, if sun and moon are reflected by Rahu and Ketu on the lagna axis, it does it may show some experiences. It's a good combination. It's a good combination based on my limited uh, research. But definitely don't break myself, Sabari. I'm not saying she's incapable of that. It's a very rare thing. Even Great, great Swamiji's people who are in charge of big mathas, they would not have experienced Nirvikarpa Samadhi. It is something very, very rare. Only a really great Rishi, if he comes back or an Avatara, may experience. Even they are not guaranteed. So it's not a, it's not a normal thing. So we should not be predicting it. <laughs> In the natal chart, yeah, 
Yeah. I'm not sure what to see from it. Of course, you can see. Yeah. yeah. First, in the beginning, basically, you see Rajdho Rahu is in Lagna. Bhargala Rahu is in Lagna, which is not so auspicious. It can even show some doubting, etc., in the religious matters, because Bhargala shows all these obstacles to the spiritual path. And that too, it is Rahu. So, some suspicion, some uh, some questioning is possible in the Rahu period. But, when the Parvatana gives its result, it is as though Mars is in Lagna. And Mars being in Lagna is Ruchika Yoga. Then, very strong strong determined pursuit of spirituality. So overall it seems like this is an interesting dasa. This is a dasa when interesting things happen. But how is the next dasa? Virgo. How is Virgo? Capricorn is the lagna, right? Taking Capricorn as lagna for the Virgo Mahadasa, what are the influences we see? Fourth and fifth? Yeah, fourth and fifth lot are in the twelfth house. So there is a nice yoga between them. Okay, what else? What? Doesn't deal. Pardon me? Yeah, 12th Lord Jupiter is affecting 12th house. Earlier 9th house was strong because of Jupiter's influence. Now it is the 12th house. So 12th Lord is affecting 12th house and the 4th and 5th Lord, basically Yokarga Venus is there. So uh, 12th house is becoming strong. Compared to earlier, compared to the previous Dasha, in this Dasha 12th house becomes strong. Of course, if 12th house is strong, you shouldn't just go ahead and predict renunciation because everybody gets some Dasha when 12th house becomes strong. And not everybody, in the case of Chantayaka Saraswati, Jayanda Saraswati and, and Swami Sivananda, exactly during that dasha they renounced. You can't predict that in every chart, but the thing is, some detachment will develop during that time definitely. So there will be more detachment than there is now. So this dasha will develop internal detachment, we can say. Because this is the real goal, 8th house being strong, ninth house being strong is good. Because ninth house being strong means you do religious activities. The eighth house being strong in a particular dasha means you do some sadhana, you put in some effort. But it is the twelfth house that needs to be strong for you to actually make some real progress and get some level of detachment. So this is an interesting dasha. But how is is the dasha pravesh chakra actually cooperating or is it creating problem? I already opened right. Okay, you are right. I already opened it. So in the dasha pravesh chakra, how are things? The twelfth house is containing Mars, that's not really strong, but, but what? How is the twelfth Lord? How is the twelfth Lord? He is with Ketu, he is in the fifth house. So Jupiter, for Jupiter, being in fifth house is very, very good. It's the house of Porpunya, and Jupiter, if he is basically put in the place of Porpunya, he will basically take full advantage of the Purapunya. So, 12th Lord with Ketu. Ketu is the Karaka of 12th. So, 12th Lord and 12th Karaka being together is very auspicious. So, 12th house basically is being strong even here. And interestingly, there is a Grahmalika from the 9th house to 12th house. So, it does seem very interesting. So, my, my feeling is until 2012, there will be some slow progress, some effort, etc. And after 2012, in the next coming nine years, there will actually be more inner progress. Until then, it is basically all the effort you have to you have to basically put in effort. But internally experiencing the detachment, that from that point of view, the real progress will start after 2012. That is my my take. Any other thoughts that you want to share? We don't see the See, Durgdasa, I haven't really done any study on how to see deities from Durgdasa. This is just spiritual progress, the path of spiritual progress. Okay. 
Ketu Mirkri? Yeah. Yeah. We only said sadhana, what kind of sadhana? Mercury like sadhana. So, uh, Bhutatva like sadhana. So, th that's all we can say. We can't really say, so pray to Mercury, so pray to Vishnu. We can't really say based on the Vishnu like that. Okay. Any other questions? Any other points? You want to see the current Antardasa just, just for curiosity or previous Antardasa? Until from November 2006 to 2007, she ran Aries Antardasa. And Antardasas are starting from Mahadasa itself. So in Aries Mahadasa, you take Leo as Lagna, right? Yeah, nothing really interesting. Fifth and ninth, fifth and tenth are, fourth, fifth and tenth are strong. And if you look at the entry chart also, you can't really, third house is strong, showing lot of determination, etc. But nothing really, well, actually Saturn and Ketu are in Lagna. That is, that is good. But let us see the next one. Cancer Dasha. What is the Dasha Lagna? Scorpio is the Lagna. So if you take Scorpio as Lagna, Lagna has Jupiter. What does it show? Lagna has Jupiter. And Jupiter shows basically intelligence, wisdom, etc. And if you look, I am looking at both. Take the natal chart as well as Dasha Pravesh Chakra. In natal chart, if you take Scorpio as Lagna, Mercury and Ketu are in Lagna. So it shows, Ketu being in Lagna shows increase of the spirituality. And here Jupiter is in Lagna. That shows more wisdom. But here you see in the Dasha Pravesh Chakra, you see excellent yogas in the ninth and 10th houses. You have Saturn, Venus, Ketu in 10th, Sun, Sun, Moon and Mercury in the ninth house. So there are good yogas in the ninth and 10th houses showing lot of dharmic activities and karmas. For me? Yeah, there is dharma karma. What? No. He is right. Ninth Lord and 10th Lord are together in the ninth house. See, just because Seshu sometimes says <laughs> silly thing, don't assume that he is silly always. Some, sometimes he very quickly comes to the right conclusion. Ninth and tenth Lord being together in ninth is also Dharma Karma Adhipati. Being any, actually together anywhere. Right. So there is Dharma Karma Adhipati Yoga. Seshu is so happy laughing now. What? Because for a change you can laugh at somebody else. Okay. So, but the thing is, do you see any such combinations in the natal chart? The twelfth lord is in Manakargas, the tenth lord from Scorpio is in Manakargasthana in debility. So it doesn't really, the ninth lord is in seventh house with Rahu. Maybe it shows some dharmic activities along with other people. But it doesn't really show big karmas etc. that we see in the separate. This is what I meant earlier. You just confirm. You don't just go by one of the parameters. You basically combine both of them. Still, some events may may happen, but you can't really predict something strong, confidently. In order to predict something confidently, you have to look at both the influences. But overall, it does seem like the current dasha as well as the next dasha are eventful from the point of view of spiritual progress. And my feeling is from 2012 to 2021, she will make considerable progress in her spiritual pursuit. Any questions? Any questions? Okay. Who wants to go next? We'll, I don't know if we can f do fully, but we'll start and do some dasha level analysis at least, yeah. and then maybe take up. Huh? Yeah. yeah. Time is 8.18, so another 10-15 minutes, we'll take one more chart. Whose chart? You guys decide, I, I, won't, I won't pick. For me, I'll do uh, all of you eventually. Yeah, next class. Whoever wants, wants now, we'll do that one. Seshus. Huh? Yeah, he has to go. Okay, actually he has to close. So, we'll, we'll, we'll close for today. We'll take some more charts in the next class. Okay? So, with that I end. Om Shanti Shanti Shanti